Are you as passionate about local governance and municipal issues as I am? Well, then the Cross Border Interviews is your show. We are here to provide you with exclusive insights and thought provoking conversations focusing on municipal matters from across Canada. And now, you have the chance to be part of our incredible journey. By backing our show for as little as $3 per month, you can help us grow and bring more exciting content to your ears. Now, you might be asking yourself, what sets the cross-border interviews apart from other shows? Well, we're not your average show. We dive deep into the unique challenges, successes, and innovative solutions of municipalities from across Canada. We bring you unbiased, unfiltered conversations about municipal issues from coast to coast to coast. By supporting our show, you become an essential part of our mission to amplify the voices of local leaders and shed light on the issues that matter most to our communities. Together, we can foster meaningful change and create stronger, more vibrant communities within our great country. Simply visit our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and show your support today. No matter how small, your contribution makes a significant difference and allows us to continue producing great shows, like the one you're about to hear. Together, let's make municipal issues matter again. Welcome to a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews, where we dive deep into the ever-changing municipal landscape here in Canada. Now, today we have a topic that has some questioning the state of municipal affairs in the province of Alberta. It's all about the recent political appointments and shuffles in the realm of municipal affairs. So buckle up, because we're about to take you on a ride. Now, for those who have been keeping up with the aftermath of the 2023 provincial election, you know that Premier Danielle Smith has reappointed the Honourable Rick McIver as the Minister of Municipal Affairs only after being shuffled out of that position when Premier Smith was sworn in in October of 2022. He was replaced in 2022 by Rebecca Schultz, who has now become the Minister of Environment. Meanwhile, the Alberta NDP in the last week appointed not only one but two critics of municipal affairs. Former Deputy Premier and Minister of Health Sarah Hoffman was appointed as the municipal affairs critic for Edmonton and Calgary, while Alberta's NDP Sherwood Park MLA Kyle Kazowski was appointed as the municipal affairs critic for mid-sized cities in rural Alberta. So what does this all mean for the pressing issues facing municipalities in Alberta? What does this mean for Alberta municipalities and the rural municipalities of Alberta? How will Hoffman and Kazowski ensure that the voices of their concerns of their respective credit portfolios are heard in the legislature? And perhaps most intriguingly, can Minister McIver live up to the expectations of Alberta municipalities and the RMA who had their hopes pinned on the continuation of Rebecca Schultz's tenure in this portfolio? Now, to help us entangle these complexities of the political jigsaw puzzle that is Alberta politics, we have invited our esteemed political pundit, Jennifer Burgess, back onto the show to try to make sense of this. So, Jennifer, how are you? Hi, Chris. I'm great. Thanks for having me on today. I'm so excited. I am too. So I want to start with the big question, and I think I I, I made reference it into the in the introduction there. Rick McIver is back as Minister of Municipal Affairs. So for those who don't know, and for those who are listening outside of Alberta, Rick McIver was first elected in 2012 in Calgary Hayes as an MLA for the Progressive Conservative Party. Prior to that election, he was a Calgary City Councillor for Ward 12 from 2001 to 2010. He ran for mayor in 2010, losing to Nahid Nenshi, our former Calgary mayor. Since he was elected to an MLA, being an MLA, he was Minister of Infrastructure, Minister of Job Skills Training Labor, Minister of Transportation, Minister of Municipal Affairs, le Interim Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party, once Jim Prentice sat, stepped down in 2015, and now he has been reappointed as Minister of Municipal Affairs. 
Jennifer, is Rick McIver the right person for this position? <laughs> yeah, great question. <laughs> I think that would really depend on who you ask. Um, you know, definitely uh, Minister McIver, you know, brings some consistency with him, like you've just listed, you know, probably one of the most experienced members in that cabinet. Um, you know, big benefit of him in this role is he knows the stakeholders already, of which there are many in municipal affairs and they're very complex. So, um, you know, I think Premier Smith appointing him signals some consistency, uh, which, you know, could be good news for some municipalities. But uh, I think it also signals a bit of, uh, you know, a danger of complacency too, I think. Uh, Minister McIver isn't the type of uh, leader to rock the boat. You know, he's probably not looking to make any big changes. He's been around for quite a while. He's had this ministry before. We kind of know what to expect from him. And I do get the sense that municipalities are looking for some big changes. And I mean, you've had conversations across the province too, and they're definitely seeking some big asks. And I think in some instances, they're feeling quite frustrated by the lack of change. So um, I'm not sure if that's what we'll see from Minister McIver. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword, I think. Now, the political ramifications for this, because he was the former Minister of Municipal Affairs under Jason Kenney, and then he was shuffled out of not only the position, but of cabinet under Premier Daniel Smith when she took office in uh, October of last year. Is this an olive branch or is this because there are other people who have municipal mm -hmm. backgrounds in this uh, caucus who she could have appointed, whether it be Livingstone, McLeod, uh, MLA, Chelsea Petroff, uh, who had some issues going into the election with some of the comments that she made. Cyril Turton from up in uh, Stony Plain. He has uh, some municipal backgrounds. Or is right. it like you said, you need someone who has some stability in the portfolio and knows the issues quite well being he has had the position before but he's also worked in infrastructure work in transportation which is some big asks that the municipalities are going to be coming to this government about yeah i mean i think the short answer to your question is yes <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely an olive branch uh you know i Mark McIver has uh quite a solid following you know especially down here in calgary where you and i are he's been around forever you know as joking with someone recently that Rick McIver is like Cher is in the music world. Like it doesn't matter what happens in Calgary politics. Like Rick McIver is going to be there. And <laughs> we, people know him. He's a known name here. He comes with, uh, you know, quite a good reputation. I think he's a pretty clean slate with a couple exceptions. Um, so I think, you know, definitely an olive branch to stakeholders here in Calgary who might be a little worried about a premier Smith uh, government. Yeah, for sure. Now, I want to talk about the Edmonton aspect here because he, the UCP have no MLAs in the Edmonton area. Yes, they have some on the outskirts of Edmonton, but Edmonton as itself is, uh, is an NDP stronghold now. Um, Rick McIver has that background. He is seen as someone who can potentially work across party lines, potentially work with the mayor of uh, Edmonton, Amarjeet Sohi, who was a former liberal cabinet minister, now mayor of Edmonton. Does this spell sort of an olive branch to them as well, not appointing someone new, but someone who has had that tenure of being in office, but also being in the political municipal realm? Yeah, I think I think that's a good observation, Chris. I mean, like you said, he has worked with quite of these stakeholders before and they know him and trust him. Um, so I think there's a sense of kind of solidifying current relationships as well as maybe holding building some new ones here in Calgary. Um, you know, I think the challenge is going to be, and I know you're going to talk about critics later on, but the both the NDP critics are very Edmonton based as well. So there's going to be a bit of, I think, competing for stakeholder territory there. But I don't think it gets a sense that's where either party is focused anyway. So it's going to be a, an interesting dynamic to watch for sure. What's the cons that come along with Rick McIver? You talk about the complacities, the complacities that he may have of not wanting to rock the boat, but can he reach out as a Calgary MLA to these rural communities who are also facing these issues? Because when I was talking to some of these communities uh, up in northern Alberta or even uh, like eastern Alberta, a lot of the issues that they're talking about don't seem to be on the radar, not only for the provincial parties, but even mm -hmm. the more established municipal stakeholders uh, organizations that we have in this country. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, you know, I was wondering myself the same thing. And I think uh, it'll be really interesting to see what's in the mandate letters when those come out, because I was looking at... Uh, 
Rebecca Schultz's letter from last time. And like that, that rural focus wasn't really in there. Um, you get the sense it was, it was very Calgary focused, like looking up to an election. So it'll be interesting to see if there is a bit of a signal from Peter Smith and a shift to, you know, bringing in some of the rural uh, stakeholders and rural colleagues. Um, you know, I, I do think Rick Whitehiver is a great choice for that. He is Calgary based, but um, his time as Minister of Transportation, I think, you know, has, has very similar stakeholders in those small municipalities. He's worked with a lot of them before they know him. So um, I think he could be a good asset there. Um, I think it'll just be interesting to see if, um, you know, groups like AUMA and RMA are going to push for different things than they have before. I mean, I do feel like the advocacy that small municipalities are working on is shifting a bit, you know, it's a changing landscape, it's a different world than it was uh, when he was last uh, kind of in that realm. So that'll be kind of what I'm watching to see is what's changed since he was there last. You talk about Rebecca Schultz, and I want to mention the elephant in the room because I did mention in the introduction, Alberta municipalities and RMA had their hopes pinned that she would be staying in that portfolio. It's while they're backtracking on what they said, Kathy Heron and Paul McLaughlin or RMA, I should say, I shouldn't say Paul McLaughlin because I just haven't had the chance to chat with him since the appointments, but it seems like they're willing to work with Rick, but they would have preferred to work with Rebecca. And for someone who has relatively a newcomer to Alberta politics, Rebecca Schultz, she made an interesting impact on these Alberta municipalities who who literally saw a friend in this government now that they have to now drop everything with Rebecca and move over to Rick McIver, who may not have the ear to the premier because he was shuffled out. Do Alberta municipalities and the rural municipalities of Alberta hope that they can have that same relationship that they had with Schultz with McIver, or are they going to start trying to, as Kathy Heron and Paul McLaughlin already has asked, to sit down with uh, Premier Smith and have that one-on-one -on -one conversation because maybe they're not going to get it if they talk to Rick McIver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll be an interesting one to navigate. And I mean, these municipalities have seen a lot of uh, ministers of municipal affairs over the last few years. Like this is really seventeen tough. now, seventeen Gosh, in the last like, eight imagine? years. <laughs> yeah, like that's quite a frustrating amount of turmoil. So, I mean, I guess the, the positive is they've done this before. <laughs> they know how to, to rebuild relationships. They know how to brief a new minister, probably a new chief of staff. I'm not sure what the DM, the deputy ministers look like in there, but maybe there's a new one too. So it might be kind of quite a lot of briefing again, which can be frustrating, but maybe also a chance for a bit of a clean slate, um, you know, Rebecca Schultz, I know, was very respected as the municipal affairs minister. I was quite surprised to see her shuffle out. She seemed very strong in that file. But um, I mean, she also kind of she had her eyes on leadership. She had some other things going on. Like you mentioned, she was fairly new um, to politics. And so someone like Rick McIver might have a bit more focus and come in with a bit more direction about what he wants to do. So there are kind of positives and negatives to both. But, um, you know, municipalities have been here before. They've built relationships before. Um, but I think that attempt to probably go right to the premier's office, I feel like would probably not be successful in the way this government is structured, is my guess. So I want to talk about the Alberta NDP now, because this, to me, is the most complex issue that I've ever seen. I, I, I've seen splitting of the health file. I've seen splitting of education into education, advanced education. I've never seen a, 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 cr a critic portfolio split into two. And the appointment of Sarah Hoffman and Kyle Kazowski as municipal affairs critic for Calgary and Edmonton for Sarah Hoffman and municipal affairs critic for mid-sized cities and rural Alberta for Kyle Kazowski. It seems very confusing to me that one person can't do this job. What did you take from this? Because to me, it just seems like you have... 30 some odd MLAs, you're going to give a critic portfolio to everyone and we're going to subdivide every portfolio that we can. Am I just thinking way too much into that? Yeah, it's, I've never seen that before either, Chris, in my tenure. And I think it's uh, you know probably largely a political decision. Um, Rachel Notley has a really big caucus right now. They're mostly new to politics. 
probably a lot of them expected to be ministers, right? Probably a lot of them expected to be in government. So it's, I think, a bit of a peacekeeping in the caucus. Um, it does seem like a bit of a buddy system. Like, they, she's kind of paired up, but, like, experienced MLA with, like, newer MLA. So it's kind of like when you start a job and you get a mentor, um, which is, I mean, maybe good for party structure. I do agree, though. I also have concerns, Chris, on what this actually means for impacts on Albertans. Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily obvious that you need to separate out Calgary and Edmonton from every other town and city. I think creating that divide can have consequences that I'm not sure are necessarily healthy for the larger political conversation. And um, also, like I mentioned earlier, I mean, um, Kyle Kazowski, hope I'm saying that right, is he's based in Sherwood Park. So I mean, they're both very like Edmonton area focused. Um, so I don't know if that's a good way to make sure mid-sized towns and Calgary are part of the conversation. I'm, um, I do, I do have a few concerns. Yeah. Who who has the bigger challenge there? Because Sarah Hoffman has to look after Calgary, which uh, the majority of seats in Calgary did go to the Alberta NDP, but the UCP do have a stronghold there. The Edmonton got completely shut out of the UCP, so the NDP sort of own the city of Edmonton, while Kyle and uh, Kyle Kazowski, the MLA for Sherwood Park, he literally has one riding that's not in a uh, city, because Lethbridge East, is Banff Can Naskis. And that would be the only, quote unquote, rural riding that they have. So in your opinion, who has it harder? Kyle, who has to go out and deal with the rural communities that the NDP were completely shut out and try to build bridges in those communities? Or is it Hoffman, who has to try to please Edmonton without upsetting them enough for the next election and keep the Calgary base that they've grown to move on forward. Yeah, I mean, I'm, they both got a, a bit of a hill ahead of them, for sure. I mean, I think it's really how you approach it. Um, I do think the the conversation leading into the election tended to become a bit divisive. And there was this very focus on the specific area in Calgary where there was perceived swing votes. I hope we can move past that and start talking about, you know, Alberta as a whole and what people as a whole are looking for representation in their government. So I think there's a real opportunity there for both of them. Um, you know, I think Sarah's going to have to spend some time in Calgary. That's going to be tough for her, for riding in Edmonton. She's also, I think, deputy house leader, deputy leader. She's got like a fairly major role in the caucus too. That's going to keep her busy. So I think making sure that she has time to be physically down here with the stakeholders is going to be important for her. And, um, you know, for Emily Kozowski, I think there is actually quite a bit of NDP support in rural Alberta. I think it's a bit of a myth that it's, you know, there's like blanket conservative territory. When you look at the vote share, there are some candidates that did really well for the NDP in the rural areas. So I think if he's able to sort of connect with those communities in the rural areas and talk, like literally have conversations with them about what's important to them and what they're struggling with, he could be really successful. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily like enemy territory out there, but I think you have to be very intentional about talking to people. Um, you know, I'd love to see a move beyond just like interacting with mayors and council, even though I know we both love the politics of rural mayors and councils. It's really fun, but at the end of the day, they don't necessarily always represent what the voters need or what the voters want. So I'd love to see some on the ground engagement from him. And I think that's would be key to making him successful. I'm going to ask a very poignant question, but in my opinion, it's a lost chance for them not appointing someone with municipal background. I know Joe CC was the minister, uh, the critic for municipal affairs prior to the election. He is now arts and culture uh, critic for uh, the NDP. Was this when you talk to municipal politicians, and I say this only talking to them for the last year and a half. They don't want politicians who come in and tell them what to do. They want someone who they can relate to. The NDP have appointed, well, a new first-term MLA in Kyle Kazowski, who was just elected, and a MLA who has been deputy premier, who has been minister of health, who has been critic for ed education in the last election, in the last term. But they don't have municipal experience. Sarah Hoffman does have that school board experience prior to being election, elected 2010 to 2015. She was a school board trustee in Edmonton. But municipal is a unique entity in itself. And the language that municipal politicians use is not the language that provincial politicians use. So 
I, I give credit to Danielle Smith for at least appointing someone who has that municipal experience, who can talk to someone in Alex, Alberta, or even uh, Didsbury, Alberta. But for the NDP, they're going to have to do some catch up, but they're also going to have to do some education on them for themselves to figure out what's the actual issues and how do we approach different municipalities because the issues in down in Cypress County are not the same issues in the MD of peace as well. Yeah, definitely. I agree. I think it's going to be a, a big challenge for them. And, um, you know, like I said, I think really, you know, encouraging MLAs to be on the ground and to talk to people um, to take advantage of the fact that there is a bit of space right now, I think, for those conversations. Um, I think that's really what they're going to have to lean on because otherwise, you know, they're they are at a disadvantage. When you look at the, the NDP bench, I mean, they have a lot of MLAs, but there isn't a lot of depth there in terms of municipal experience. You know, I, I don't and know. All the that, same could be said to the same could be said a bit for the UCP. They have definitely. three that I know yeah. for for now that they I know of for sure. There might be some who have ran municipally but never been elected, but I know for for sure how do have that municipal experience. Yeah, exactly. So it's going to be um, a bit of a challenge for the NDP, though, not being in government. They don't necessarily have the resources of a ministry. They don't have a you know a bureaucracy, deputy managers that have all that experience and connect them with stakeholders. They're going to have to do that on their own. Um, so I, I hope they do. You know, I do think there is opportunity to do it. I hope, like you said, they do learn the language. They do talk to people. Um, I think they could take a bit of lessons from their their last term and like, you know, Bill 6 is like an example, the Farm Safety Act, which I think was actually a very municipal <laughs> issue. Um, and I think that's a great example of the challenge you're pointing to, Chris, with, you know, not necessarily being on the ground and talking to people in the language that they speak. So I think hopefully some lessons have been learned from that. Hopefully they they learn to connect with their stakeholders there and um, take advantage of that. Um, we'll, we'll see. I, I should clarify that. I, I do I do mention the fact that the two critics have don't have municipal experience and that may be a detriment to them. But Rebecca Schultz didn't have municipal experience either. And the municipalities love her. So I I could be eating crow in a year's time when people say Kyle and Sarah are great to have as in the critic portfolio. Just from my perspective, and this is the outsider's perspective here, it just it doesn't the 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 smell test doesn't pass here. And I just hope that Kyle and Sarah are able to connect with well hopefully kyle is able to connect with municipal leaders because there's a lot of issues going on in municipalities right now and hopefully they're going to be on the radar i want to talk about the the legislature dynamic here because rick mciver i've watched him you and i have probably seen him in action in the legislative assembly uh, in question period in oral questions uh and I've seen Sarah Hoffman. I, I don't know Kyle. He's never answered a question, asked a question in the ledge. So this is going to be a new dynamic for him. Is it an evenly uh, set up match? Is it an evenly set up match where the municipal issues and to quote uh, Kathy Heron here, municipal issues are not the sexy issues. They're not the ones that people vote on. They're not the ones that people get engaged on. But they're the issues that matter. And if and I'm paraphrasing here, I should say, um, is Rick McIver and Sarah Hoffman going to be able to bring the municipal issues, the $30 billion deficit, infrastructure deficit that municipalities are facing, the rural crime issues, the uh, the healthcare shortages in municipalities to the forefront where the issues that are affecting our municipalities are going to be heard, but also written about in the media? <laughs> yeah, great question. <laughs> Take you some notes here. I, I hope so. I think you're right. I think it traditionally for all governments and all representatives, it's been hard to bring these issues to the forefront. Um, but, well, I think, yeah. ethics, transparency, healthcare, taxes, those are the ones that we heard about during the, yeah. the, during, the during the last provincial election. I did not hear one and I say this with respect to both party leaders or both part people and parties, because I have friends on both sides of the aisle. I did not hear one political party leader or candidate say, we need to address the $30 billion infrastructure deficit in the next uh, four years, or our municipalities are going to be screwed. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's scary that it wasn't an issue, but when the sexy issues like ethics and leadership and healthcare come up, then everyone's talking about it. But our roads that 
have potholes like there's no tomorrow like it's swiss cheese sometimes it it's not as sexy but it's provincial issues that mean so much to municipalities yeah agreed i think it's it's always a challenge to bring those issues to the forefront and i think that you know the work ahead of any municipal affairs critic or minister is to to draw that connection to voters between what they're doing and their ministry to like those like you said on the ground issues to potholes to your community rec centers um, to bridges and roads, you know, things you use every day. Um, people don't necessarily draw that line between um, the, the city and municipal affairs in the province. So I think there's a bit of like legislative education, I think that needs to go on and making sure that those are brought to the forefront. Um, you know, and I think about what municipalities have on their minds. Um, I was thinking yesterday about the city charters. <laughs> Remember those um, issues like that that I think were were pretty successfully brought to the forefront of political conversation for a few years. I remember, um, you know, Mayor Ninchi at the time, and um, I must John Iverson. Iverson, yeah, at the time, like being in the media quite a bit talking about it, and that's an issue that's hard to get public attention on. But I think if you can connect it to people to what's going on in their everyday lives and make it a bit of a source of municipal pride and bring some attention to what goes on in your city, I think it can work. So I think there have been successful examples of how that could happen. But then, of course, you know, who knows what happened to the charters? They're kind of floating in limbo out there somewhere. And so it's it takes some commitment, I think, to drive something like that through. Um, I... I don't know if uh, Sarah, Sarah Hoffman, sorry, Mr. McIver are the people to do that. I haven't necessarily seen that from them in their past career, but they have a real opportunity ahead of them. Um, I think there's such interesting work to do in municipal affairs. There's so much um, policy development. It's a very old fashioned ministry in a lot of ways. And I think that's what we're, a lot of we're hearing is municipalities want change. And on the flip side of that, there's also the issues that municipalities are facing internally as well. We see in the city of Chestermere, there was an article in the uh, Calgary Herald just recently, literally about two days ago, or I think Wednesday by the time this airs, uh, last Wednesday, um, that the city of Chestermere is going through a pro- went through a provincial inspection and the province uh, appointed a uh, mediator to look after what's going on in the city because there were some irregularities and some issues that were going on. And uh, Rebecca Schultz was the uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs who made that appointment. Now, Rick McIver his, it has gone through this, I'm assuming, because I've looked at the past reports. And... A lot of municipalities right now are going through a bit of a learning curve because a lot of new council members have been elected and they don't traditionally know the roles of what a municipality does and what the jurisdictions are. And now the minister has to go in and crack some heads. And I'm using that word politely here because the minute the mayor of Chestermere and Rick McIver, I'm assuming play on the same uh, political team, but Sometimes you have to piss off your friends. And I saw a, a, an article, the Calgary Herald, Herald article, and I'm going to put it in the show notes for anyone who wants to look, look at it. He said he hopes that the city of Chestermere follows through with all the recommendations and the uh, points that Minister Schultz had put out in October of last year. So I'm looking forward to seeing if Rick McIver and even Sarah Hoffman stand up and say, okay, if you're running your municipality incorrectly, the province needs to step in. And for those municipalities who are asking the province to step in, what's that going to look like? Because it's two elected governments and it's always hard to overstep your boundaries and say to another elected government, we're going to dissolve you. And it looks like that's the way that Chester Mirror might be going. And if Rick McIver has to do that, that's going to piss off a lot of quote unquote right of center, or actually I would say far right voters. And that's not what Daniel Smith needs. So I hope Rick McIver and Sarah Hoffman can play ball together at the same time as well, because these issues that are important to municipalities are not, UCP issues or NDP issues or even liberal issues or Green Party or uh, whatever issues, they're Alberta issues. And I'm hoping, God forbid, that someone can actually be the adult in the room and say, sometimes you have to make the tough decisions. (laughs) Yeah, it's a tough one, man. And I think this is, uh, you know, where something like like a city charter comes in handy, right, where you have kind of a shared agreement of how you're going to work together. Because as you mentioned, there is, you know, 
the municipal act, it lays out how the province and cities and towns relate to each other. But then there's also politics, which doesn't follow legislation, as we all know, and it's a different beast. And so it's, it often just starts with relationships. Um, but it's, yeah, that'll be a, a tough one to wrangle. And I hope we can kind of move away from this idea of like, you know, the parent kind of, or the, sorry, the province kind of being the parent and the kids being the cities and it being more collaborative. Um, I think that always proves to be more effective. Um, so I, yeah, I, it's a bit of a culture change, I think. Well, um, and that I, yeah. Alberta municipalities have been calling that for that for a few months now. They've been saying, we want to see it at the table. We don't want to be treated yeah. like the kid in the room. We, we are at uh, the same level of government that you are. And to quote my friend Scott Pierce, the president of FCM, they're the government of proximity, for God's sakes. The yep. issues that the municipalities are dealing with, they make the biggest uh, life-altering decisions in your life the moment after the decisions are made. When you have a provincial issue or a provincial bylaw or a motion or a policy, it could take two, three, four, five months mm -hmm. until it actually gets implemented. You change something in the land use bylaw, it's getting changed the next day. If you put a service fee levy up uh, or increase the service level, it gets changed the next day. So there's a lot of things that municipalities are dealing with right now. And the speed of municipalities needs to be taken into consideration. And it can't be a provincial level speed it has to be at the municipal level speed and i hope to god they can do it and i hope that mckiver smith notley hoffman kazowski can all treat these municipalities like an equal and not like a freaking child like they have been for the last few years yeah, and I mean, there's opportunity there, right? I think if you could have a successful partnership with the municipality, you get some political wins out of that, right? So it, it could be a win-win situation for both of them. I mean, I think I think a lot of that conversation comes down to funding agreements, unfortunately, as much as that seems like not very, you know, interesting or political. I think for a lot of municipalities, like they're struggling with revenue and they're waiting to see, I know the MSI program is sunsetting, something else new is coming in. So I think agreements like that are going to have a huge impact on those conversations. I hope municipalities are at the table for them. I hope there's, you know, actual authentic engagement with those programs. That will make a huge difference. I want to talk about some of the mayors right now. And I want to talk about Jody Gondek to begin with, because we are both the Cal we are both from in Calgary. Um, Calgary was the battleground in the last election. Uh, I'm assuming Jody Gondek and Rick McIver know each other. I'm assuming Sarah Hoffman and uh, Jody Gondek know each other. Um, what's their working relationship going to be like? Are they going to have an open door policy with the two biggest mayors in the province of Alberta? Because we know that. <laughs> okay, for the. <laughs> okay. Why do you not think that? <laughs> I maybe I'm just being a bit cynical. I mean, I hope so. I think it's just, uh, you know, they're both the NDP and the UCP are coming off hot off a really difficult election. Um, it well, you know, wasn't that long ago. They're still kind of figuring out what this terrain is. And uh, municipalities like Calgary were kind of caught in the middle, I and mean, especially Calgary, because they were perceived, you know, to be the swing vote. Um, something really but I think interesting. They, I think they wanted to be stuck in that position, didn't they? Because now the issues of Calgary, fuck, the, pardon my French for those who are listening, but they got a $300 million uh, invest, investment in the Calgary arena because of the UCP. Yeah, I think what is interesting, though, is that's not what Calgary asked for. <laughs> <laughs> what Calgary got, though, is what Calgary got. But Mayor Gondek did put out a clear ask to both parties ahead of the election for what um, she was looking for in terms of Calgary. And it was investment in affordable housing, investment in public public transit and revitalizing downtown. And I mean, maybe you could say the event center helps with downtown, but it certainly doesn't help with the other things. So I think I, to me, it doesn't suggest that conversation is happening on a, a specific authentic level. I think it was about, you know, scoring some political points with a swing vote. I don't think it had to do with relationships with municipalities. So I, th I think there's work to do there. Are the mid-sized cities going to be upset over the next four years? Because with the last election, and we saw the battleground being Calgary, and I'm assuming the battleground is going to be Calgary in 2027. I'm assuming the battleground is going to be a Calgary in 2032. Are the mid-size cities going to be lost over the next four years and the infrastructure funding is going to go to the larger urban centers, Edmonton and Calgary? Because you, you speak to municipal leaders from across Alberta. 
pardon me, who are outside of the two larger cities. And they tell me on a regular basis that just because that you have the population there, just because you have the seats there does not mean that the infrastructure issues out in the communities in Panoka County, in Penhold, in uh, Clearwater County, over in Cypress County are not as important. Is this going to be for municipal affairs? And I think this is the big question that is the hypothesis of what I've been thinking about for the last few months, few weeks, I should say, is. Is municipal affairs now just really Edmonton and Calgary affairs? Oof, I mean, <laughs> not. I think I feel like that's my answer to a lot of your questions today, Chris. Is I'm I'm hopeful not, but I it's a real risk. I, I, I like think- someone who's very hopeful because I'm being the pessimist and I love being the pessimist sometimes. <laughs> oh, good. That's why we're a good match, Chris. There you I, go. I am hopeful. I think there's opportunity. Um, you know, like I said, they just came off hot off an election and there were some lessons learned about what worked and what didn't work. I think the NDP was hoping to pick up some mid-sized seats that they didn't. And so they, I think this is an opportunity for them to like rethink their messaging and their um, engagement there a bit. And um, same with the UCP, you know, I think there is a few seats the UCP didn't expect to lose. So um, I think there's an opportunity to look at, you know, what, like those places need arenas too, you know, and it's, it's funny that, you know, Calgary, the city of Calgary wasn't asking for arena, but we got this and now like, I know in Red Deer specifically, like they do need an arena really badly. So um, there's there's wins to be had there, but it's also, like you said, it's a real community need and um, there needs to be advocates there. I hope organizations like Alberta municipalities um, can really lean into some leadership there. I think their, um, their advocacy strategy is going to have to shift up a bit with these changes in government and opposition. They're going to have to change a bit the way they do things and advocating for projects like that, I hope are high priority for them. I was speaking to a former MLA from rural Alberta just recently, and they said, and I should, how do I put this? They were talking about the fact that the issues that the rural municipalities face are brought to them, and then they bring it to the uh, caucus table addressing these issues. We know that the UCP is very much a rural party in 2023 right now. The majority of their seats came from rural Alberta. I think all but four, Grand Prairie, the two in Red Deer, and one in Lethbridge. Medicine Hat, it was more largely rural than urban. But those four are traditionally urban seats. Everywhere else, besides the Calgary seats that they picked up, are more uh, rural. Mm -hmm. Do the backbencher MLAs in rural Alberta do the cabinet ministers from rural Alberta have to play a significant role in the next four years in addressing the rural issues that municipalities face because while they do have their uh constituents work that they have to deal with they also have to deal with the mayors the reeves the the councillors in their area and if they don't get what they want we might see some Nomination challenges in 2027. And I can't believe I'm already talking about 2027. But can I just say for one second, I'm going to go on a little tangent here. I'm not the first one who said this, the Alberta NDP are, because they literally have started saying we need to get ready for 2027 on social media. And I went, it it literally hasn't even been a month since the election. And we're already talking about the next one. Okay, good for you guys. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not ready. (laughs) <laughs> but do the do, do the UCP MLAs in rural Alberta have to play a bigger role in the next four years in addressing these rural issues while the more cabinet central MLAs need to focus on the two urban centers to try to win back some of those communities? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a strategy for sure. I mean, I think when you look at some of the, the rural MLAs UCP have, they're quite embedded in their communities. Like they do have quite strong candidates in terms of... Um, you know, who knows them and who they're connected with. Usually they, a lot of them live in their ridings and that, that has huge benefit if you're an MLA who knows your community and people know you. So I would heavily lean into that if I were Danielle Smith, you know, I would send resources to those EDAs there and have local fundraising events. Um, like you said, I mean, keeping those, that council and mayor on side can have huge benefits um, to a party. We've seen that and we've seen that where it goes sideways and, you know, you don't have that. And um, I remember there was a situation like a few years ago where people were going to the critic and getting them to bring up a question period, the fact that a minister wouldn't return their phone calls and like that, that's what you do definitely do not want if you're a government. So trying to avoid that situation and having those relationships, um, this is a great time to establish that and lean into those MLAs that know their communities. 
Well, just on that note, uh, the the mayor, the current reeve of the MD of Peace up in uh, North Central Alberta, because he did not want to be called the Northern Community, but North Central Alberta, um, sure. he did say that his local MLA, who was at the time just a backbencher, Dan Williams from Peace River, had never met with him for four years. Like for four years, he had not met with the yeah, reeve of one of the I think that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Like, I, I am shocked shocked that a uh, local MLA and don't get me wrong. It's not that many municipalities compared to Saskatchewan that, that we have, or even rural communities. I have the list and I went through it. It's not that big of an area for <laughs> municipalities up in Northern Alberta. So when I heard that they had not met for four years, kind of shook me. And I said, why not? So hopefully now that he's a cabinet minister, he will have time to meet with them. <laughs> Well, it's his job and it's what he's drawing a public salary for. So, <laughs> Whoop, there it is. <laughs> I want to end on this question. And this is the big one. Do Smith and Notley have to play a more active role in reaching out to municipal leaders? Because mm -hmm. uh, Alberta municipalities, the RMA have uh, rural municipalities of Alberta have said they want to sit down with Daniel Smith. They've had passing chats with Daniel Smith, but they haven't had the informal, here's our board members, let's have a conversation. Mm. Do, do Daniel Smith and Rachel Notley need to have a better relate, working relationship with the municipalities and the two large municipal organizations within the province of Alberta going forward? At least I think they do. Yeah, <laughs> I think, me. you know, yes and no. I think they, you know, they should definitely be able to get a meeting. Like that seems like a pretty base assumption for a relationship. Um, you know, you want to have that communication channel open. But I mean, like I said earlier, I think, you know, them really delegating to their MLAs who know those communities is probably a stronger strategy. So I think, you know, having your MLAs show that they have support of their leader, um, you know, doing a little local fundraiser and having Rachel Notley or Daniel Smith pop in, something like that can get, uh, you know, so much political like win out of it. And so it doesn't have to be big things. Like, I don't think they necessarily need to be driving all around the province, meeting everyone and spending their time doing that, but just showing support for the local, you know, whether it's representative or maybe a candidate or, you know, however it's working down there. I mean, that's, I think, how you get your political wins. Um, but you know, you definitely don't want to have the situation like we referenced earlier where someone is saying we haven't met with these people in four years they're not returning my phone calls because that becomes a story and that becomes something like you know you and i remember three years later so you want to avoid that situation but i would say you know lean into the people you have on your team who already know their communities um i would agree wholeheartedly with that i think that the relationship between the province and the municipalities is key right now it is a key relationship that needs to be fostered. Municipalities are the government of proximity, as I've already said, and they are the front lines that are dealing with these issues. Uh, they they often say, I think it's 60% of the infrastructure in this province are owned by municipalities, yet they only get 10 cents of the tax dollars coming back to them. So if they don't fix these issues now, it's going to be a lot worse in about 10 years. Heck, it's going to be a lot worse in five years if we don't start fixing these issues now. I know $30 billion seems like a very large number, but that number could balloon to $60 billion or $80 billion in five years from now. So hopefully Rick McIver, hopefully Sarah Hoffman, hopefully Kyle Kazowski uh, are up for the challenge in trying to address these issues. I should say that I have reached out to Rick McIver's office. They're waiting for the mandate letters before they give interviews. I, I know they did do an interview with Calgary Herald, but I'm assuming because of the context of how I worded my interview, they wanted uh, more context about what the mandate letter will say. So hopefully we'll have that over the summer, if not back in September. And then we did reach out to the Alberta NDP. As always, I'm assuming our emails are, will fall on hopefully not deaf ears this time, but hopefully someone will actually get back to us from the Alberta NDP and reach out to us and we'll be able to sit down with both Sarah Hoffman and Kyle Kazowski about how they see their role is the critics in addressing these issues that are put forward, because if we don't address these now, we're not going to address them in the future. Jennifer, last word to you if you have any. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I could say it better myself. I mean, there's some big challenges coming up here in Alberta. I don't think we can ignore the issue of climate change that hits those municipal governments first. 
Um, you know, I think part of this conversation also has to be about our Indigenous partners who are in the same role. You know, they, they're they the government of proximity as well. Um, and they are housed in a totally different uh, municipal or sorry, provincial ministry. And so I hope those ministries can work together. I hope they can talk about climate change in this government, which seems like a bit of a sticky topic. But those are going to hit soon and they're going to hit municipalities first. So I, I hope those can be uh, top of mind for both uh, this minister and these critics. I, I did reach out to Kathy Heron just recently, and she did say that Rick McIver is the now the minister of everything because municipalities <laughs> are dealing with everything, infrastructure, transportation, and environment. So I'm going to just uh, just randomly say that R Rebecca Schultz is not done with municipal affairs as much as she is the new minister of environment because I'm assuming, I know you should never assume in this world, but I'm going to say that Rebecca Schultz is going to have to deal with some municipal issues when it comes to climate change here over the next four years. But I could be wrong. Yep. <laughs> um, but thank you so much, Jennifer, for joining us for another episode, especially on this Sunday afternoon or the day after Canada Day. It's always great to chat with you. Yeah, always a pleasure, Chris. So to our viewers, thank you for tuning in, for being part of the conversation. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all our latest interviews, special episodes. We have some amazing guests lined up and we can't wait to share you their stories. But also remember that we will be taking a hiatus from July 21st to September 4th because we are doing a big tour of Canada, going to some of these great municipalities who have graciously accepted a spot to have coffee with them and go visit their communities. Now, if you're able to, please consider backing the show to help us continue to grow and produce more high quality content. Every little bit helps and we appreciate your support. A link to our support page on the Cross Border Interviews website is in the show notes. And finally, as much as we love our phones and technology, especially after this weekend's Twitter outage, let's remember to put them down and have real life in-person conversations with the people in our lives, even if it's just for five minutes. Thank you again for watching we'll see you next time on the cross-border interviews remember until then just keep talking <laughs>